arrhythmias, just like ACS that we talked about earlier, this really to me represents what emergency medicine is all about because it's one of those diseases where if you make the diagnosis, then patients generally have a really great outcome, but if you miss the diagnosis on a malignant arrhythmia, they tend to have horrendous outcomes and oftentimes you need to make the diagnosis before you have a chance to ask for help or before your cardiologist or whoever else is overreading the EKG, before they get a chance to overread the EKG and call you back for any help. Um, again, a few points just to get started. This is not at all intended to be a comprehensive arrhythmia course. I'm going to be focusing on some pearls and pitfalls and a handful of selected cases which I think represent common mistakes or there is some basics in, in this session that we'll go through. And, but I'm gonna to try to throw some curveballs at you as we go through this. And just like earlier today, all of the cases I present to you and all the examples I show you are actual patients that presented to emergency departments or in, in a couple of cases, primary care offices also. My wife is a primary care physician, so she shares some cases with me also. And um, again, practice, practice, practice is the best way to get good EDKGs. So you're gonna have access to the PDF for all of the EKGs we're about to go through. Please take advantage of that and look through the cases after you leave a month from now, six months from now, because the more EKGs you look at, the better you're gonna get at arrhythmias as well. If there's any questions at all that come up, uh, and you don't want to ask them now, or maybe you think of some great questions after the course. It could be tomorrow. It can be a year from now. It doesn't matter. There's my email, and this has been my email for as long as I can remember. Please just send me any questions, or if you have interesting cases that you want to share, please by all means stay in touch. I, I don't mind at all getting emails from people. And also, if you have interesting cases that you want to share, <clears throat> as you'll see, a lot of the cases I present are cases that people have, have sent me, and... I always ask for permission to use them in the cases uh, and in the sessions. Uh, just like this morning, we're gonna skip over the basics. We will cover some basics, but for the most part, this isn't a how to read an EKG course. Uh, again, if anyone's looking at this 12 lead EKG and scratching their head thinking, what in the world's going on? This is probably not the right room for you. Okay, and by the way, please don't ever check a 12 lead on VFib. Um, the person that sent this to me swore to me that it was his partner who got the 12 lead on this patient that was in cardiac arrest in VFib. This really should be a rhythm strip diagnosis. All right, I hope nobody ever looks at a rhythm strip and says, you know, I think this is VFib, but I want to confirm it in 11 more leads. No, just, <laughs> just go ahead, and if there's no pulse, just shock them. All right, um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through just a brief overview of some of the bradycardias, tachycardias, and some miscellaneous things. And I'm going to try to move through that relatively quickly, and then we're going to get on to the fun stuff, which is the vast majority of what we're going to do this evening, and that's cases, actual cases that we go through. But I just want to make sure everybody's up to speed and present some basics. And also, these basics are going to be helpful for when I throw some of these curveballs at you a little bit later on, because I am going to try to fool you with some of these cases. We're, we'll start out easy, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to throw some tougher cases at you as well. So as I mentioned this morning, I like collecting signs, and so people send me signs from everywhere. We'll take little mental breaks with some of these signs as we go. Okay, so first let's talk about bradycardias and AV blocks. I, I know a lot of people get a little bit confused with bradycardias and AV blocks, but hopefully I'm going to present a simple system to you to make things really simple, and you'll see bradycardias are really, really easy. And tachycardias are just a little bit more complicated but a lot more fun and very, very easy. So first of all, there are three different types of, of brady, bradycardias. There's sinus bradycardia, there's junctional rhythms, which are bradycardic by their very nature, and ventricular sinus rhythm means that the impulse is coming from the sinus node down through the AV node and then shoots through the his Purkinje system and innervates the ventricle. By the way, how do you know that an impulse is sinus in origin? By definition, to call it sinus, the P waves should be upright in one, two, three, and F, and usually inverted in AVR. If you don't see that, then typically it's called an ectopic atrial rhythm. And if you forget what I just said, nobody's gonna die. So it's just a little semantics there, okay? Junctional rhythms, uh, the, junk, the AV node has an intrinsic rate of about 40 to 60, so when you see slow junctional rhythms, almost always they're in the 40 to 60 range, and usually junctional rhythms are narrow. And then ventricular rhythms are always wide, and the rate is typically about 20 to 40. 
if a ventricular rhythm, and we'll get into this a little bit more later also, but if you ever see a ventricular rhythm, which is between 40 up to 120, that's called an accelerated ventricular escape rhythm, all right? So 20 to 40, it's just called ventricular escape rhythm. 40 to 120 is called accelerated ventricular escape rhythm, also known as accelerated idioventricular rhythm. We'll get to the importance of that in a bit. And if you see a ventricular escape rhythm, which is faster than 120, that's called VTAC, all right? So just some semantics there. Here's your classic sinus rhythm or sinus bradycardia. And you'll notice that because the P waves are upright in one and two and three and F, and L and inverted in AVR, we're allowed to call this sinus, all right? Simple stuff. Junctional rhythm, you see that this is a slow rhythm. It's narrow, the rate's about 40 to 60. This is your typical junctional rhythm. Now with the junctional rhythm, you often don't see P waves because the P waves may be buried inside the cuirass. So if you look up here at me for just a second, if this is your, junk, your AV node, the impulse shoots down to the ventricle, but it also shoots up to the atrium. So you don't just get a ventricular contraction. Oftentimes you get an atrial contraction also, but the atrial contraction, the P wave, is typically buried inside the cuirass, so you don't see it. But sometimes you may see the P wave just before or just after the QRS. So you can sometimes see the P wave just after the QRS. Not in this case, I'll show you another one later. And that's called a retrograde P wave. You may see the P wave just before the, the QRS. But if that happens, it'll be a very short PR. So whenever you see a short PR, meaning less than 120 milliseconds, whenever you see a short PR, there's two things to think about. One of them is junctional rhythm. And the other, what's the other one that gives you a short PR? Pre-excitation, good, like WPW. All right, so short PR, think junctional rhythms, and think about pre-excitation, typically. <clears throat> All right? And some of these miscellaneous points we're gonna re-emphasize a little bit later on, you'll see where they're relevant. This is a ventricular escape rhythm. You see the rate is classic 20 to 40, and it's wide, it's a wide QRS complex. The beginning of the QRS is just before that blip, and the end of the QRS is just after the blip. All right? And, um, and again, remember, <clears throat> if it's faster than 40, it's called an accelerated adioventricular rhythm. If it's faster than 120, it's called VTAC. Okay, so enough about those bradycardias. Then we get into AV blocks. AV blocks are a piece of cake. We're going to talk about first degree. We'll talk about second degree, MOBUS 1 and MOBUS 2, third degree. Very, very easy. All you need to do is look at the PR. Remember what a normal PR interval is. A normal PR interval is 120 up to 200 milliseconds. So first degree AV block simply means that the PR is greater than 120 or greater than 200 milliseconds. One P wave for every QRS. So it's P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS. And the PR is a little bit long, as you see up here. No big deal, all right? You don't need to treat this. There's no treatment for this. If you want, you can look what medications they're on. A first degree AV block is a normal part of aging. So as we get older, our PR gradually prolongs, but it doesn't in and of itself need to be treated. And this is gonna be an important point later on. The only time you treat an AV block is when they're bradycardic. In fact, you don't even need to worry about the AV block. It's the bradycardia that you treat. It's not the AV block. And that's a real important point. I'm gonna to try to fool you with that a little bit later on. Anytime you're dealing with the rhythm, the treatment is based on what the ventricle is doing, not what the atrium is doing, and not what the AV block is. Your ACLS treatment is always based on the ventricular rate. So here's a person with a first degree AV block, and if I told you the blood pressure is 75, do you need to treat this? Uh, do you need to treat the rhythm? Of course, you can treat a blood pressure of 75, but do you need to treat the rhythm? The answer is no, because the ventricle rate is pretty good. It's a pretty normal ventricular rate, so you don't need to treat the rhythm. So how are you gonna treat this patient with a blood pressure of 75? Give them fluids, treat their sepsis, whatever, but it's not the rhythm that's causing the hypotension. All right, as long as the ventricular rate is normal, meaning 50 up to 100, 120, something like that, normal ventricular rhythm or rate, you don't need to treat the rhythm itself, all right? Again, point will be re-emphasized as we go. So first degree AV block has very little relevance in emergency medicine. 
All right, now we're getting into some more fun stuff. Second degree AV block. There's two types of second degree AV block. There's second degree AV block type one, also known as Mobitz one, also known as Wankybach. And then there's second degree AV block type two, also known as Mobitz two. For ease of discussion, I'm just gonna use the Mobitz terms, all right? So first of all, Mobitz one. Mobitz one means that the PR interval gradually lengthens and then you've got a lonely P wave, a P wave that is not accompanied by QRS, and then it starts over again, all right? So I think everybody knows that. The other key point about the Mobitz, before you ever call something Mobitz, you have to make sure the P to P interval maps out regularly as well. So here's a second degree AV block type one, this is a Mobitz one, and you'll notice down there that, let's see, the PR interval is gradually getting longer and longer and longer, and then You've got a lonely P wave right there, and then it starts over again. And you see, when it starts over again, you've got a really short PR. The PR just before the block was a lot longer. So if you ever have any doubts about whether you're dealing with the Mobitz one or two, take a look at the PR just before the lonely P wave and just after the lonely P wave, and you can tell that they're different, all right? That's your Mobitz one. And also, if you map the P to P to P to interval, if you add calipers and map the P to P interval all the way across, this is completely regular all the way across, including the drop beat. All right, everyone okay with that? Okay, Mobitz one, piece of cake. Mobitz two means all of your PRs are absolutely constant. All right, I'm gonna step down here for just a second and move the clock so I can see this. So all of your PR intervals have to be absolutely constant. So you'll notice that <clears throat> your PR interval there is exactly the same as that, exactly the same as that, and that, and that. And so all of your PRs are constant. If you see even one PR interval on the entire rhythm strip, even one PR interval change, you just ruled out Mobitz two. That's how strict the definition is for Mobitz 2, all right? Mobitz 2, also, the P to P interval has to stay constant. So if you have calipers and you went from there to there to there to there to there to there, that's absolutely constant. If it's not constant, you can't call it Mobitz, <clears throat> all right? Should be really constant. The other thing you'll notice about Mobitz 2 is that because this is more of an infranodal block, the QRS is pretty much always at least a little wide, sometimes very wide, but at least a little bit wide. Whereas Mobitz 1 usually is pretty narrow QRS, all right? Mobitz 1 usually is vagal, and so if you have an unstable Mobitz 1 with bradycardia, usually atropine works nicely because atropine's for vagal bradycardia. Mobitz 2, atropine doesn't work. So skip the atropine, go right to a pacer. All right, all right. Now there's one special type of, of a second degree AV block, and this is just a matter of semantics, but you may encounter this issue. In fact, uh, this physician actually sent it to me, sent this case to me just a couple days ago where there was a little bit of a dispute with the cardiologist. He was saying that this is Mobitz and the cardiologist was saying, no, it's not. So, all right, let me go back for just a second. This is Mobitz two. everyone's okay with that. And you'll notice that with this Mobitz 2, there's three P waves, one, two, three P waves for every two QRS complexes. So this is called three to two, all right? Maybe you'll see four to three, you might see five to four, six to five, whatever you may have. When you see, when you see a second degree V block with two to one conduction, technically you don't have enough PR intervals to figure out whether it would be lengthening, Mobus 1, or staying constant, Mobus 2. So by convention, if you see second degree AV block with two to one conduction, you're supposed to call it second degree AV block with two to one conduction. You're not supposed to call it Mobus 1. You're not supposed to call it Mobus 2. The purists will say, don't call it Mobus 1, don't call it Mobus 2, just call it second degree AV block with two to one conduction. My response is, get a life. Well, who cares, right? Um, <clears throat> QRS is narrow, so from my standpoint, it's probably a Mobus 1. But 
Sometimes the cardiologists, especially the electrophysiologists, who are the purists out there, will say, well, when you've got secondary vehicle block with two to one, you don't have enough PRs to see if it's prolonging or staying constant, so you're not supposed to declare whether it's MOVIS one or MOVIS two. Does that kind of make sense? All right, all right. Okay, so everyone's okay with MOBITS 1 versus MOBITS 2. How do you tell the difference between MOBITS 1 and MOBITS 2? You simply look at the PR. If the PR is prolonging, it's MOBITS 1. PR staying constant, it's MOBITS 2. That's all there is to telling the difference between MOBITS 1 and MOBITS 2. You simply need to look at the PR. You look at nothing else on the rhythm strip, just the PR. And I think when people start looking elsewhere, they get confused. If all you do is just focus on the PRs, you'll nail your diagnosis. Same thing applies for third degree. With third degree heart block, once again, the P to P interval stays constant. So the atrium is doing its own thing. The ventricle is doing its own thing, but they're not talking to each other at all. And so the result is that the PR intervals are randomly changing. If you look at, <clears throat> let's see, there's a really long PR and then a shorter PR, but still kind of long, and then a non-existent PR, you see that? P is right on the QRS, and then a really long one, and then a normal short one, and so the PRs are randomly changing, and that tells you that you're dealing with the third degree AV block, all right? So how do you tell the difference between MOBITS one, MOBITS two, and third degree? All you do is look at the PR, that's all there is to it. MOBITS 1, PR is gradually increasing, then lonely P wave. MOBITS 2, PRs everywhere are exactly the same with lonely P waves. With third degree heart block, the PRs are randomly changing, and there's a lot of lonely P waves. All right? With these AV blocks, I often refer to them as electrocardiographic polyuria. There's too much P. There's too many P waves there. So when you see P, too many P waves compared to the QRS, I call it polyuria. And then how do you tell the difference between MOBIS 1, MOBIS 2, and third degree? All you need to do is look at the PR, all right? If you ever get confused, it's because you looked too much. Just look at the PRs and you'll nail your diagnosis, all right? That's it. That's all there is to AV blocks. You've nailed it, all right? Just looking at the PRs. <clears throat> It really is that simple. Okay. <clears throat> so other signs. Okay, so moving forward now, let's talk about the tachycardias. As I mentioned, tachycardias are just a little bit more complex, just a little bit though, but they're a lot more fun, all right? So tachycardia, there's three questions you ask whenever you see the tachycardia. Is it wide or narrow? Is it regular or irregular? And then what's the atrium doing? If you ask three, these three questions, every time you look at a tachycardia, again, you're gonna nail your diagnosis. So we're gonna do some differentials as we go through this, all right? So first of all, let's talk about narrow, regular tachycardia, all right? There's only three types of narrow, regular tachycardia. There's sinus tach, there's atrial flutter with two to one conduction, and there's SVT, all right? How do you tell the difference between these three? You ask yourself, what's the atrium doing? With sinus tach, you've got one P with every QRS. So P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, and so on, right? With SVT, you often don't see P waves because they are often buried inside the QRS, although sometimes they pop out right after the QRS. Remember what we said about junctional rhythms? If it's a junctional SVT, you'll see a P wave pop out right after the QRS, all right? And then with flutter, you see two P waves for every QRS, PPQRS, 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 and so on, all right? Now, flutter's kind of tricky, and so we're gonna spend a little time talking about flutter a little bit later on. Flutter is the most common misdiagnosed tachydysrhythmia, and the reason is that when you've got flutter, a lot of times you've got one P wave buried in the QRS and one P wave buried in the T wave. So it can be sometimes kind of tough to see those two P waves with every QRS. So you've, whenever you see a heart rate of around 150, plus or minus a little bit, you've gotta be really paranoid about flutter. So I'm gonna try to build paranoia into you a little bit later on, paranoia about flutter, because flutter really, really tries to fool you. All right, so let's look at some examples here. Here's your classic sinus tachycardia, <clears throat> the most common tachycardia I'm sure that we see. P 
PQRS, 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 looking up there in V1, V1 is your money lead for looking at P waves, one P wave for every QRS. Down here, as the heart rate gets really fast, you'll notice that the P wave and the preceding T wave start fusing together, and it kind of looks like camel humps. So whenever you see camel hump T waves, worry that you've got a P wave buried in there. All right, again, that's another point that I'm gonna reemphasize a little bit later on. Camel hump T waves, worry about a P wave buried in there. All right, here's another example of sinus tack and another nice example, see those camel humps? That's your T wave there and then your P wave, T wave and then your P wave and so on. All right, so sinus tachycardia. By the way, how fast can you mount a sinus tachycardia? This can be a helpful pearl. This is not 100%, but it's pretty good. Um, how fast can a person's heart produce a sinus tachycardia? Anyone know? Gener I didn't really hear it. I heard <laughs> So generally, it's 220 minus your age. Is that what she said? All right, perfect. All right, so 220 minus your age. So <clears throat> if you have a 20-year-old, a 20-year-old could probably mount a sinus tach of almost 200. All right, if you have a two-year-old, that's really tough because two-year-olds, you've seen our newborns, they can have a sinus tachycardia of 220. It becomes very, very difficult. If you have an 80-year-old, an 80-year-old is only going to be able to mount a sinus tach of about 140. So let's say, let's say you're looking at this. So the heart rate here is, I don't know, 160. If I told you this was an 80-year-old with a heart rate of 160, you already know sinus tach is off the table which means it's only one of two possibilities, a flutter or SVT, all right? So 220 minus your age can sometimes be helpful in terms of narrowing your diagnosis, all right? All right, this was a young person who, this was a young person who was extremely dehydrated. This was a person who um, was thyrotoxic and had a severe tachycardia. All right, so here's your SVT, narrow regular tachycardia, and you'll notice up here, Remember how I said with SVT, sometimes you can have P waves pop out right after the QRS. Take a look at that. There's a retrograde P wave right there. Right? I don't have too much of a caffeine tremor right now, so there it is. All right. So um, oftentimes you see little P waves right after the QRS, and that can be helpful at suggesting an SVT. All right. Now there's a lot of different types of SVT. There's AV reentry tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, reciprocating tachycardia. You know what? Forget it all. Just lump them all into one category that we're gonna call SVT, all right? The electrophysiologist can sort through all those different things, but for us in acute care medicine, we can lump them all because they're pretty much all treated the same way <clears throat> and have similar underlying relatively benign diagnosis or, or etiologies. <clears throat> and then here's your atrial flutter with two to one conduction. It's narrow, it's regular. What's the atrium doing? Two P waves for every QRS. It produces that classic sawtooth type of pattern. And you'll notice the sawtooth, the P waves are actually inverted. Oftentimes, flutter gives you inverted P waves. So that right there is a, is a flutter wave, and that's a flutter wave. And then that is a flutter wave right there, and so on. So flutter oftentimes produces inverted atrial beats, inverted P waves, <clears throat> which gives you that... Um, that sawtooth type of pattern, right? I like looking at V1. V1 to me is the money lead. If you look up here, they actually, you can see upright. So there is, there is a P wave and there and there and there. And if you map it out, if you're wondering, you know, how do you know that's a P wave and not a T wave? Well, if that maps out with the other beats, then you have to assume it's a P wave. There's no reason why a T wave would map out with P waves, all right? So if it maps out regularly, then assume that you're looking at a P wave. So V1 often is a great lead, and that's another aside we'll come back to a little bit later on. If you think about where V1 sits, looking up here for a second, V1 sits right here, right over top of the right atrium, which is where the sinus node is. So if, if I would say, if you're in Vegas, we are in Vegas, so if, if you're gonna put your money on one lead, which lead is, is most likely gonna tell you whether there's P waves, yes or no, put your money on V1. All right, I'm not saying you only look at V1, look in all of the leads. You've paid for all 12 leads, so use them all. Look at all of them. But V1 is always the first lead I look at when I'm trying to figure out if they're P waves or not. All right, sometimes P waves are only present in one lead, and oftentimes it's just V1. All right, anyway, that's an aside. We'll come back to that a little bit more later on as well. All right, 
So, all right, before we move on to this, let's recap. Narrow, regular tachycardia. Three possibilities. Remember what they are? Sinus tach, SVT, and flutter with two to one conduction. All right? Narrow, irregular tachycardia. Once again, only three possibilities. You've got AFib, you've got flutter with variable conduction, and then you've got multifocal atrial tachycardia. How do you tell the difference between these three? You ask the third question what's the atrium doing? With fib, the atrium is fibrillating, so you just see some bumpiness of the atrial rhythm, but nothing that maps out regularly. Sometimes you'll see bumps that look like P waves, but it doesn't map out with anything, so just some bumpiness. <clears throat> with flutter with variable conduction, once again, you see flutter waves. What is flutter with variable conduction? Well, a minute ago, I said flutter with two to one conduction. That means that there's two P waves for every QRS, but there's no rule that says flutter has to be two to one. You can get a rhythm strip where flutter is two to one, then three to one, then two to one, then five to one, then four to one, then two to one, then three to one. So if the ratio is changing, the term, thus the term flutter with variable conduction, the resulting ventricular rhythm can be irregular. That's what uh, flutter with variable conduction means. And then multifocal atrial tachycardia, this typically is in your pulmonary patients, COPD, Back when we had uh, patients on theophylline, they would sometimes get it when they were a little theophylline toxic. We see it now in asthmatics. We see it sometimes in pulmonary hypertension patients. I've seen it in people with bad pneumonias. So typically it's associated with some type of pulmonary disease. And in this scenario, you've got different morphologies for P waves, at least three different morphologies. So every QRS has a P wave, but the morphologies can change, all right? And how do you treat MAT? You just treat the underlying cause. So here's your atrial fibrillation. It's irregularly irregular, and you don't see any clear-cut P waves that march out. All right? This is the most common sustained tachydysrhythmia that we all see. Here's atrial flutter with variable conduction. So if you look down there at the rhythm strip, notice it starts out 2 to 1, then 3 to 1, then 2 to 1, then 4 to 1, then 2 to 1. And so the ratio is changing, and that's why the resulting rhythm is irregular. Right? But you still see those inverted P waves. Again, the P waves, those are inverted P waves right there. There's one right there, and there's another P wave inverted right there, and then right there, and then right there, and so on. And so if you march those out, the atrial rate is right around 300. The ventricular rate is 150 plus or minus. All right? That's flutter with variable conduction. <clears throat> and then here's your multifocal atrial tachycardia. And again, looking down there at the rhythm strip, let's see, moving left to right, there's a P wave. It's kind of a big P wave. That's a different P wave there. And then you've got an inverted P wave. So we've already got three different P waves. And then maybe, let's see, I think there is a biphasic looking P wave somewhere in there. That's a little bit different right there. And so there's at least three different P waves in this rhythm strip. And it's fast and irregular, all right? How do you treat this? You just treat the underlying condition. So if I told you this patient has a heart rate of 75 and they've got a heart rate of about 140 or so, you know, ACLS might have you believe that every unstable tachycardia needs to be shocked. That's not true. There's two tachycardias that you never shock, right? You never shock sinus tach and you never shock MAT. You just treat the underlying cause. What happens if you shock sinus tach or MAT? Your Presganey's fault, that's about it, right? It doesn't help the patient. I suppose maybe you cause enough pain, it releases endogenous catecholamines, that, that raises their blood pressure. But it's not, how, it's not how you want to do it, all right? So you just give them fluids, treat the underlying cause, all right? Okay, so let's review once again. Forget this slide. Narrow, regular tachycardia, three types. Remember what they are? Sinus tach, SVT, and flutter with two to one. How do you tell the difference between the three? What's the atrium doing? Narrow, irregular tachycardia, three types. AFib, a flutter with variable conduction, and MAT. How do you tell the difference between the three? Ask, what's the atrium doing? Simple, all right? Okay, now let's get on to the wide, regular tachycardias. And once again, there's three that I'm putting up here. I'm probably doing a disservice by even putting three up here. You've got at the top sinus tach 
with aberrant conduction, meaning bundle branch block usually. So if you see sinus tack with the bundle, that'll give you wide regular. So P QRS, that's wide. P, wide QRS, P, wide QRS, P, wide QRS, and so on. All right, simple enough. P waves are present, and you see one P wave with every QRS. Ventricular tachycardia, you often don't see P waves, or if you see P waves, they are not associated with the QRS. That's referred to as AV dissociation. We'll show examples of that. And you'll notice I put up there, the ventricular rate has to be at least 120. Some authors go by 130. I prefer going by 130, but we'll just go with 120 for this course. That's not often taught. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. If you ever look at a rhythm and it looks like VTAC, but it's less than 120, don't call it VTAC. It's probably not VTAC. Instead, it's probably a mimic of VTAC. What are some mimics of VTAC? Hyperkalemia, tricyclic overdose, and a reperfusion arrhythmia called accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Remember I mentioned that a few minutes ago. We're gonna come back to that again. And then at the bottom, SVT with the bundle branch block pattern. If you forget that SVT with the bundle exists, good for you, all right? You will save more lives, okay? We'll talk about that in just a bit. All right, so here's your classic ventricular tachycardia. It's regular, it's wide, all right? Here's SVT with a right bundle. Now be very careful about calling this SVT with the right bundle. And again, I mentioned I'm, I'm, I'm probably doing you a disservice by even talking about this. Why is that? I'm sure all of you have heard before that whenever you see a regular wide complex tachycardia, whenever you have any doubt about whether it's VTAC or SVT with the bundle, always assume it's VTAC, right? Everyone's heard that before? Why is that? Because if you assume it's VTAC and it turns out to be SVT, your treatments for VTAC work. So great. On the other hand, if you assume it's SVT, but it's actually VTAC, some of your treatments for SVT can actually kill the VTAC patient. So if you just assume all of them are VTAC, if you always have doubt, and therefore assume every single one of them is VTAC, you will save every life, all right? Which is what we wanna do. If you start trying to figure things out, you know, ah, there's a taller left rabbit ear, right rabbit ear, there's this morphology or that morphology, I promise you people will die. I guarantee it, right? Cardiologists have been coming up with all kinds of algorithms and morphologies for about 60 years, all kinds of algorithms to try to tell the difference between VTAC versus SVT with the bundle, and nobody has come up with a reliable algorithm that distinguishes between the two. So the bottom line I would say is just assume all of them are VTAC and every life gets saved, all right? So again, there's no reliable way of ruling out VTAC, so just call them all VTAC. So whenever I teach what is the differential for wide regular tachycardia, think VTAC number one. Number two, think VTAC. Number three, VTAC, maybe VTAC or Maybe sinus tack with the bundle, but SVT with the bundle, forget it, all right? And no matter how smart you think you are, there are many, many, many smart people who have killed patients because they thought too much, they thought, they tried to figure it out, they came up with SVT and it was wrong, all right? So just call it VTAC, everybody gets saved. <clears throat> all right, so wide irregular now, there's two really important diagnoses. AFib with the bundle, all right? It's irregularly regular, morph, uh, and the morphologies are pretty much the same. Um, and then AFib with Wolf Parkinson White. We're gonna spend a good deal of time talking about WPW. This is something you might see once or twice in your career, and if you don't remember what we talk about, you will kill these patients, all right? Many physicians have done this, unfortunately, to patients. This is a life-saving bit of knowledge if you don't remember this, your therapy will actually kill these patients. And we'll get into that a little in more detail later on. But AFib, WP, this is AFib with a bundle. Notice how the morphologies are all the same. Here's AFib with the bundle. Notice how the morphologies are all the same. Here's AFib with pre-excitation. Notice that the morphologies are changing. 
QRS width is changing. Some are more narrow, some are more wide. We'll talk later about why that happens. Here's AFib with WPW again. Take a look at the morphologies are changing. And in some places, extremely, extremely rapid. If you mistakenly call this AFib with a bundle and treat this patient with calcium channel blockers or beta blockers or DIG or amio, they die. All right, so you've got to remember AFib with WPW. And that's why we're going to spend a decent amount of time on it later on. All right, um, what else? Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and torsade dipont. I don't know French, I can't pronounce it too well, but torsade dipont. Who's from Canada? Somebody says they're from Canada. All right, let's hear it. You're from Quebec. All right, let's hear it. Oh, I can never say that. <laughs> it sounds so sophisticated the way you say it, too. All right. Um, <laughs> so, torsade. So, what's the difference? A lot of people use these terms interchangeably polymorphic VTAC and torsade dipont. They're not the same thing. What's the difference? So torsade is polymorphic VTAC in a French person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so just kidding. No. Torsade is polymorphic VTAC that's associated with the prolonged QT. All right? It's very, very important to remember. There's two types of polymorphic VTAC. Think of it this way. There's two types of polymorphic VTAC. There's generic run-of-the-mill normal QT polymorphic VTAC, and there's the torsade type of polymorphic VTAC, defined by a prolonged QT, right? The reason why it's so important to make this distinction, let's say you're dealing with this rhythm, all right? Polymorphic VTAC, it's VTAC, rates over 120, and the morphologies are changing, thus the term polymorphic VTAC, all right? When you see this patient, what are you gonna do? They're gonna be unstable. Almost certainly they'll be unstable, so you're gonna shock them. So you shock them out of it, now they're back to sinus rhythm, all right? Hooray. So now you get a new 12 lead on the patient, about the they're in science rhythm, and you look at the 12 lead, and it's a normal QT. So you can say, oh, that is normal QT, so that must have been that generic run-of-the-mill polymorphic VTAC. Well, I probably ought to put them on something to prevent them from going back into it. Use whatever you want. Lidocaine, amio, procainamide, those all work perfectly fine. All right? Okay, now let's change the scenario. Let's say you've got this patient, you shock them out of it, now they're in sinus rhythm. So now you get a new 12 lead, they're in sinus rhythm, and you look at the 12 lead and you see a prolonged QT, and you say, oh my gosh, there's a prolonged QT. That means that must have been the torsade type of polymorphic VTAC. Well, I probably ought to put them on something to prevent them from going back into it. What are you gonna put them on? It's gotta be magnesium. And in fact, if you use amyl or procainamide, what will those do to the pro prolonged QT? They'll make it worse, and you put them right back into torsade. We've done that, all right? So that's why, that's the main reason it's so important to know that there's this distinction between generic run-of-the-mill polymorphic VTAC versus the torsade type because of the treatment. The torsade type, what do you do with that patient? You put them on mag, and you look for the underlying cause and treat it. What are the underlying causes of prolonged QT? We'll get into that also. Hypomag, hypo-K, hypocalcemia, are they on some drugs that prolong the QT, and so on, all right? But that's what you do with torsade. What do you do with the run-of-the-mill polymorphic VTAC, normal QT? You put them on amyolidocaine procainamide, and then you work them up for ACS. Because almost always, generic polymorphic VTAC is caused by acute cardiac ischemia. Torsade is caused by drugs or hypoelectrolytes. Very, very different. So the treatment is different and the workup is very different. All right? So it's so important to know that there's this distinction between generic run in the mill, polymorphic VTAC, normal QT, versus the torsade type. All right? Prolonged QT. All right? If you, if you happen to have an EKG right before they went into the arrhythmia, you can look at the QT on that and, and know also, all right? So for example, here's a rhythm strip, and, and you'll notice just before the arrhythmia begins, it, there's a hint of a prolonged QT. This is torsade because of the prolonged QT, all right? Now sometimes people look at the rhythm strip here, and they say, well, the cuirasses are bigger and smaller, bigger, smaller, so that must mean it's torsade wrong. All right, you cannot call it torsade just because bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, because generic run-of-the-mill polymorph VTAC does that also. 
All right? So the distinction between generic polymorphy tech versus torsade is not based on the morphology of the QRS complexes. It's 100% based on the QT, either before they went into it or after you shock them out of it. All right? Everyone okay with that? Very important. Okay. And then there's one other wide complex rhythm that we've got to talk about, and we've mentioned it a couple times already. It's accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So let me say this all over again. If you have a ventricular escape rhythm, the rate is 20 to 40. If your ventricular rhythm is faster than 120 or 130, it's called VTAC. But if it's in that middle zone between 40 and 120, if you have a ventricular rhythm that's between 40 and 120, that's called an accelerated ventricular escape rhythm, or more commonly, accelerated idioventricular rhythm, or AIVR. This is most commonly a reperfusion arrhythmia. What does that mean? This is the type of rhythm that usually happens when somebody has an occluded artery that suddenly opens, all right? So the classic scenario is, uh, by the way, how many people here when you're taking care of STEMIs, you use thrombolytics. Anybody? So one, so a couple people, all right? So you guys probably still see this, all right? Um, back before cath labs popped up everywhere, we used to see this also. Back when I started, uh, when I started, when I was in residency and then definitely after residency working out in the community, we would routinely use TPA for, for STEMIs. So person comes in with a STEMI, you look at the EKG, it's a STEMI, how do you treat a STEMI? We'd push TPA or streptokinase or tenecteplase, whatever. You push TPA and then <clears throat> um, you'd hope for the artery to open up. Now the artery doesn't open up like that. Sometimes the artery, sometimes the TPA can take 20 or 30 minutes, 45 minutes, sometimes as much as an hour and a half before the TPA seeks into the clot and opens it up. But at the moment the clot opens up, what typically happens is the patient develops an arrhythmia, this, this arrhythmia. Accelerate the ventricular rhythm. It looks just like VTAC, except it's slower, right? Now, normally when this rhythm happens, it lasts for about five or 10 seconds and it goes away and everything's good. By that point, the patient's pain is usually better. Their ST segments have come down and they're doing well. They're stable. This is not a destabilizing rhythm. The patient's just chilling. They're happy. They're not unstable, they're not hypotensive, it doesn't produce chest pain, nothing. Usually last five or 10 seconds, goes away, all right? Every now and then, however, it might last four or five minutes, which is long enough for somebody to check a 12 lead and panic. Because they get this 12 lead and your computer, which is programmed to fool you, whoever programs those EKG machines, has a really evil sense of humor because they programmed them to fool you, all right? The computer's gonna call this VTAC. It's not VTAC because the rate's not fast enough. It's not 120, all right? But your computer's gonna call it VTAC anyway just to mess with you. And if you look at the top and say, oh my God, they're in VTAC and they're stable. So, oh my God, they're in stable VTAC. I better give them lidocaine or amio or procainamide what do those drugs do to this rhythm? They turn it into asystole. They abolish the escape rhythm, all right? And I've, I've, I know of cases like that. People have sent me cases. <clears throat> this is one of them. This was a patient that had an anterior wall STEMI. The patient got TPA at a community hospital. And about 45 minutes later, the patient went into this rhythm. They grabbed a quick 12 lead. The computer called it VTAC. They panicked. They gave the patient some lidocaine. The patient went right into asystole. It's a very reliable kill, all right? Um, so, and, and there's many, many cases like this happen. It's common enough in history that you wouldn't be able to pu even publish a case like this. Most people don't want to run out and publish their mistakes anyway, but um, that's a different matter, all right? So what do you do when you see this? When you give the TPA, when you see this, I say you've got two choices. You can either walk up to the patient and give them a high five, because it means the artery's opening up, your TPA is working. Or you take a step away from the patient, put your hands in your pockets, and just do a slow turn, Think, talk about the football game or basketball game, and by the time you're looking back at the patient, it's gone, and everything's good, 
all right? It doesn't destabilize the patient. It, it destabilizes the staff, all right? So if you really want to use a medication, I tell people you can use Valium on yourself, all right? But nothing for the patient. Cardiologists, they see this all the time. Take, patients go up to the cath lab. They open up the balloon. The patient reperfuses. They see this rhythm on the monitor. What do they do? Nothing. They're happy to see it, all right? <clears throat> so I'll show you more cases of this as we go. But when the rate's under 120, it's not VTAC. All right? Okay, and then finally, defibrillation, extremely rapid, disorganized. By definition, there's no pulse. By definition, there cannot be a pulse. All right? I emphasize that. When I was an intern working in the CCU, we had a post-MI patient that was up there, hooked up all to all the monitors. Suddenly, the, the alarm started going off. His eyes were closed. So uh, it was reading V-fib, V-fib. So my senior medicine resident grabbed the paddles, went running over and shocked this poor guy who was simply taking a nap. And one of his leads had come loose. This one's kind of jiggling a little bit. So if we had simply checked for a pulse, we would have said, hey, he's got a pulse. It can't be V-fib. But we didn't do that. So we never got Christmas cards from him. Okay. <clears throat> immediate defibrillation. How immediate? Absolutely immediate. For, um, this is a cardiac arrest aside, but... For every one minute that somebody's in V-fib that you're not shocking them, there's a 10% drop in survival. That's how important it is to shock them absolutely as quickly as possible when they go into V-fib. All right? So hopefully they're on the monitor. Don't waste time doing CPR. You know, definitely do CPR until the monitor and defibrillator are ready. But as soon as that defibrillator is ready, you get people out of the way and you shock them as quick as possible. All right? And there's, of course, your V-fib. <clears throat> All right, so summing things up. Bradycardias and AV blocks. Again, diagnosis is based on close attention to the PR intervals. And people always get confused about MOVIS 1, MOVIS 2, and third degree. It's a piece of cake. All you need to do is simply look at the PRs. That's it. If you get confused, it's because you look too much. Just look at the PRs. Are they gradually increasing, MOBIS 1? Are they all absolutely identical, MOBIS 2? Or are they randomly changing? That's your third degree. Right? And then tachycardia, based on narrow versus wide, regular versus irregular. And then the key question after that is, what's the atrium doing? All right, questions? <clears throat> Everyone's good with that? All right. We'll keep marching forward then. All right, on to some more fun stuff. We're going to do some cases. We're going to start out with some easy ones just to get you warmed up. And then curveballs will start flying. Case number one, 48-year-old man started some new blood pressure medicine. Now is complaining of lightheadedness. He's got a blood pressure of 80. What do you think? So again, this is one we looked at earlier. You see that there's a long PR, but there's one P wave for every QRS. So this is just sinus with a first degree AV block. And the ventricular rate's pretty good. What is the ventricular rate? 95. So first degree AV block, ventricular rate 95. How would you want to treat this person? Yeah, give them fluids, right? You don't need to give them atropine or pace them because the ventricular rate's 95 and it's all about the ventricle. How fast is the ventricle? If the ventricle's too slow, then you pace them. If the ventricle's way too fast, then you shock them. But if the ventricle is a pretty decent rate, you know, I'd say anywhere from 50 up to um, 120, 130, I'm not gonna pace or shock that person, okay? All right, pretty simple. Here's a 57-year-old guy who took too much of his blood pressure medicine. So he has a slow rhythm and it's narrow, so automatically we can take ventricular escape off the map because it's narrow, right? If it's slow, it's either sinus, Brady, or a junctional rhythm. Junctional, good, exactly. So this is junctional rhythm, and you see that there's no P wave down here. Actually, if we get towards the end, actually, there's a, hey, there's a P wave that popped out there. You see that? But it's a short PR. So that's an example of what junctional rhythms can sometimes do. You can sometimes get the P wave just before or just after. If it's just before, it'll be a short PR. And there's two things that give you short PR, junctional rhythms and WPW, pre-excitation. All right. Um, so 
How would you treat this patient? Are they unstable? Yes. All right. By the way, there's four cardinal signs of instability in ACLS. All right. Hypotension, decreased mental status, ischemic chest pain, and acute heart failure. All right. So if somebody has one of those four things, then they'd be considered unstable. All right, this person's hypotensive, so you can consider this patient unstable. Now, is this an unstable bradycardia? Is the rate too slow? Yeah, it is. It's a pretty, pretty darn slow rate, right? Ventricular rate's 40. So this is an unstable bradycardia that I think that we would want to treat. And typically for a junctional escape rhythm, this is something that you can use atropine for. All right, narrow QRS, you can use, use atropine. All right. Now, actually, the story, if you want to take into account what actually happened with this patient, what happened here was um, he was on low pressure. He went to see a new doctor who prescribed metoprolol. And so didn't, he wasn't told to stop taking his low pressure. So he was, he was on a lower dose of low pressure plus a higher dose of low pressure, metoprolol. So he was doubling up on his beta blocker. Didn't realize that it was the same medication. So how do you treat beta blocker toxicity? Glucagon, right? Glucagon, and then take a step away from the stretcher, right? You know why? Side effect of glucagon will make you vomit, so step away from the stretcher, <laughs> all right? Um, if this were a calcium channel blocker, you'd give them some calcium, all right? Simple enough. All right, they're going to get tougher. All right, 70-year-old woman with four days of nausea, vomiting, malaise, and she's got a blood pressure of 80. I think at triage, the machine is stuck on 80, all right? Now, by the way, these... Um, these uh, spiky things, that's just artifact. Those are not pacer spikes, so don't make anything of that. But you've got three rhythm strips here. So first question, is there polyuria? Is there too much P? Yes, there's too many P's. All right, so this is either Mobus 1, Mobus 2, or third degree. How do you tell the difference between the three? You simply look at the PR, exactly. So look at the PRs. Take your pick which rhythm strip you want to look at. Maybe the... The, the one on top is probably, I think it's the best one to look at. So what is the PR doing? All right. How many people say Mobus 1? How many people say Mobus 2? How many see third degree? How many refuse to take care of this patient? All right, so, <laughs> so if you, okay, let's, let's see. Where's our lonely P wave? All right, there's a lonely P right there, all right? So let's start back up here, all right? We'll compare that PR to that PR to that PR. It kind of looks the same, but, you know, but that's different, all right? So when a Mobitz one is very slowly progressing, the PRs can look the same, but then it really changes right before the drop. So what, what I'll often do is look at the lonely P wave and compare the PR just before to the PR just after, clearly different, right? And the fact that they're different, Mobus 2 is gone. So now it's either Mobus 1 or third degree. So then if you keep looking at this, you see that there's a pattern where the PR, it seems to be gradually increasing than the lonely P. Again, compare the PR right after versus right before and the change is obvious there. If you're looking at the changing PRs just to the naked eye, it doesn't look like there's much change there, but then right before the drop, then it suddenly gets bigger and then starts out again. So th this is a Mobitz 1, all right, with the rate of 94. This patient's got a blood pressure of 80. So Mobitz 1, blood pressure of 80, how do you want to treat the rhythm? How many people say atropine? Pace. Fluids. All right, I didn't get to the fluids. Exactly. So again, when you're deciding how, whether to treat the rhythm or not, treatment of the rhythm is based on what? The ventricle. And what's the ventricular rate here? 94, which is pretty good. So this patient doesn't need rhythm treatment. All right? So, I mean, you might want to have the Zoll pacer nearby if, if you run into problems. But if the ventricle is beating 94, this hypotension is not due to the rhythm. All right? So, so this is a scenario where, the, yeah, the patient's got a Mobus 1, but with the ventricular rate 94, it's not causing the hypotension. So this is a person that you just want to give fluids. And also Mobus 1, a lot of people live in Mobus 1. If there's people in this audience, I'm sure there's a few that 
run marathons, do triathlons, things like that, that it's, it's very possible that you live in a Mobitz 1. Um, and it's totally normal. It's just if you have high vagal tone, you may live with a Mobitz 1. You'd probably have a lower heart rate than this, though. All right? All right. So that's a little bit of a curveball. Again, remember, treatment is entirely based on what the ventricle's doing, not the atrium, not the AV block. It's all about the ventricle. If the ventricle's beating at a pretty good rate, then the rhythm is not causing the instability. It's something else. Dehydration, what, what did she come in with? Uh, nausea, vomiting, malaise, maybe she's just got a gastroenteritis and is dehydrated, all right? Okay. Uh, number four, 62-year-old man with shortness of breath and chest pain. Darn blood pressure is 80 once again. All right? You got three more rhythm strips. Do you see polyuria? Yes. Okay, so simple question. Mobus 1, Mobus 2, or third degree? How do you tell the difference? Just look at the PR. All right? So what is the PR doing? <clears throat> Gradually increasing. Staying the same or randomly changing? I think I heard somebody say randomly changing. All right, so let's take a look up here. There is a PR which is different from that. So automatically MOBIS2 gone, all right? So is there any pattern to this? Well, there's a P and a P wave there. Pretty normal P and then practically no PR. So that's the tip off that it is probably not a MOBIS1 and then Longer and then shorter and then longer and then shorter. So randomly changing, this is your third degree. All right. Now this patient has a ventricular rate of 48. That's pretty slow. So this patient does have an unstable bradycardia. And with this patient, I think um, generally you'd probably go right to a pacer. In general, sinus bradycardia and Mobitz 1, try some atropine first. Mobitz 2 and 3rd degree, just go right to a pacer, all right? It's unlikely that something like this is going to be vagal, so atropine only works for vagal bradycardias, all right? Questions? Everyone okay with that? All right, number five, there's a little artifact here, but deal with it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. This was the best quality EKG we could get. Okay, now once again, you see that there are P waves. Is everyone, is everyone on board to call this um, polyuria? There's a P wave that's not conducted, and then, let's see, a couple of P waves that, there's a P wave not conducted there, and then some artifacts, sorry about that. P wave not conducted, there's another P wave not conducted. All right. So, once again, we're dealing with a question about Mobitz 1, Mobitz 2, or third degree. Just look at the PRs, all right? So, let me help you with that. So, that PR, I think I heard the answer already. So, that PR looks the same as that, which is the same as that, which is the same as that. That's, we can skip that because that's kind of tough, but it, it would be, and then that's the same and that's the same. So the PRs are all staying constant, and that means that this is a Mobus 2, all right? And very characteristic of Mobus 2, there's a wide QRS, all right? There's a left bundle here, all right? Um, this patient came in with syncope, but now is doing okay, blood pressure 120. So in all likelihood, if she had symptoms and has a Mobus 2, she's probably gonna be heading towards a permanent pacer, but does she need to be paced at this moment? Probably not. If she's stable right now, what I would probably do is I'd put the pacer pads on her and be ready to go. But if she's got a blood pressure that's pretty good, right now she's awake, she's not in heart failure or everything else, I probably wouldn't bother turning the pacer on just because there's pain associated with that. Anytime you pace somebody, you have to give them some, some um, fentanyl or morphine or something else like that. And I'd uh, be getting her set up for a permanent pacer. All right, questions? Everyone okay with that? All right, good. So Mobitz 2 with 3 to 2 conduction, that simply means that there's three P waves with every two QRS complexes. All right. All right. Any questions so far? So, so somebody from California sent this to me. Texting while driving kills, but for more driving tips, Texas. 
at safety to 79191. Okay. Forty-four-year-old man complaining of weakness and really low blood pressure. <clears throat> no P waves. Um, yeah, it, there's wide QRS complexes, and the rate is really slow. So this is this would probably be defined as a ventricular escape rhythm also known as an idioventricular rhythm. If it's not faster than 40, we're not gonna call it an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, but ventricular escape rhythm. Um, what if I told you that this patient got uh, some atropine and it didn't work? Well, no surprise, ventricular escape rhythms are not vagal, so atropine's not gonna work. What if I told you that transcutaneous pacing was attempted and didn't capture? Which is what happened. What type of electrolyte? Yeah, good, so hyperkalemia. So that's exactly what this is. This was hyperkalemia. So this is one of the curveballs. I wanna go on a little bit of a hyperkalemia digression here, all right? Hyperkalemia is notorious for mimicking strange bradycardias. And for whatever reason, this is really not commonly taught. And yet, this is really common. Does anybody here ever imagine this? Do you ever take care of non-compliant dialysis patients? Does that ever happen to you? So, so not just Baltimore, okay. I'll bet you you've seen this before and maybe didn't recognize it, and I'll also bet you, again, if every one of you comes back to this course next year, every one of you will come back and say, I saw it. Now that I know about it or I'm looking for it, I saw it, all right? That's how common it is, absolutely guaranteed. Now, everybody learns about peak T waves, right? Everybody learns about peak T waves, and everyone learns about widening of the QRS complex, and of course, everybody learns about um, at the bottom of this list is gonna be sine wave, but hyperkalemia does all kinds of things. It'll prolong the PR, and then the P wave goes flat. So pause for just a second and take a look at what's on this slide. Imagine the P wave's gone, and it's a wide QRS. Starts kind of looking like a ventricular rhythm, right? Remember how we said this is a mimic of VTAC, often at slower rates, okay? But what else can hyperkalemia do? Tacky dysrhythmias, brady dysrhythmias, strange, bizarre AV blocks. It can cause ST elevation, ST depression, new axis changes, new fascicular blocks, and of course, the sine wave that every medical student knows about. So everybody learns about the peak T wave, wide QRS, and sine wave, but there's a lot of things that hyperkalemia does. I always refer to hyperkalemia as the great imitator or the syphilis of electrocardiography, right? It can do anything. So especially this AV block thing, and for whatever reason, I don't know why it's not commonly taught. This is, I don't think this is, I think this is still not in Tintinale or Rosen or in many of the internal medicine books. It's in the EKG books. And maybe in some of the nephrology books, maybe, but it's not commonly taught, and yet it's so, so common. And yet, when people have actually studied this, bradycardia is one of the most predictive hyper-K factors associated with adverse, um, adverse cardiac outcomes. <clears throat> more predictive than peak T waves, more predictive than wide QRS, believe it or not. So this is classic hyper-K, right? Nobody would miss this. You've got your classic peak T waves, you've got the wide QRS, you've got prolongation of the PR interval. Nobody's gonna miss this. This would be on textbooks and on board exams probably. This is also classic hyper-K. By the way, the EKG machine called this anterior STEMI because of the ST elevation. Remember, what do we say about the machine? It's there to fool you. Now, I don't think anybody here would be fooled because you've got big time peak T waves up here and I think our P waves are pretty much gone. Um, in fact, if you only had a rhythm strip of lead two, this kind of looks like a, just a plain old ventricular rhythm, right? But again, nobody's gonna be fooled by that because of the peak T waves. And now we're starting to approach the sine wave. I think most people would pick up on this. At the very least, most people would look at this and say this is either hyper-K or a tricyclic overdose. And if you start pushing bicarb, that works for both of them, right? These are all classic hyper-K. But this is also classic hyper-K. Take a look at this. Strange pauses, bradycardias, and you've got your peak T waves up here, but bizarre bradycardias and AV blocks in there. Potassium here was 
in the upper sevens. Here's also another severe hyper K. Potassium is around eight. Strange bradycardias. And take a look at that rhythm strip. Some are narrow, some are wide. I didn't think you're allowed to have any narrow QRS complexes, at least based on the teaching. And maybe there's a little bit of peaking of the T waves. When I show this EKG to a lot of people, they don't even see the peak T waves because they're so focused on the rhythm that's up there. This is also classic hyper K. There's some peak T waves out laterally. Again, a lot of people look at this EKG and totally miss the peak T waves out there because they're so focused on the rhythm. They're looking at this and saying, you know, there's a, there's a P wave there. And then is this, you know, gosh, is this Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2? You know, forget it. Don't think so much about it. It's bizarre. And that's another pearl. Anytime you ever look at a rhythm or an EKG and the first word that pops into your head is the word bizarre. Bizarre in emergency medicine equals hyper K. Bizarre in emergency medicine equals calcium of bicarb. I don't care why the word pops into your head. If you look at somebody and they're just dressed bizarre, give them calcium bicarb, right? What's the harm? You just might save a life. And what happens if you're wrong? What happens if you give calcium to someone who's not hyperkalemic? What happens to them? Their bones get stronger. Nothing happens, right? It's great. What happens if you give sodium? If I gave everybody in this room two amps of rapid IV push sodium bicarb, push, push, what would happen to you? Nothing. It gets metabolized and is gone from your system within about 15 or 20 minutes. Yet, if they are hyper K, you just save their life. You'll see the QRS narrow right before your eyes. All right? So when in doubt, I'm not saying you give calcium, bicarb and, calcium and bicarb willy-nilly, but when in doubt, when you've got this strange bradycardia, have that calcium and bicarb in your back pocket, mentally at least. Um, it doesn't work with, with, ACLS often doesn't teach that. Um, and that's actually an important aside. ACLS was never written for tox and metabolic patients. ACLS was written for the 65-year-old guy who eats cheesesteak sandwiches for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He smokes two packs per day. He spends all day gambling in the casinos. You probably see him on your way back up to the room. And then he suddenly falls to the ground with an arrhythmia. That is who ACLS was written for. It was never intended for toxin metabolic patients. In fact, it fails miserably. And as we'll discuss later, in some cases, ACLS actually kills patients with toxin metabolic conditions right? It'll kill your torsad patient. ACLS, uh, if you use some of those ACLS medications, uh, amiodarone or procainamide, it'll kill them. Amiodarone or procainamide in AIVR or lidocaine, it'll kill them. So ACLS was never intended for a lot of those patients. Um, it was never intended for hyperkalemia. ACLS is really down on calcium and bicarb, and yet those are the drugs of choice when you're dealing with hyperkalemia um, initially, right? Of, of course, your insulin also. So here's another one. This, this is the highest potassium level I've ever taken care of in a person who survived with a good outcome, 10.2. Take a look at the rate here. The rate, I don't even know what the rate is. It's not even worth counting, right? Um, and then there's some peaking of the T waves out here. This is classic hyper K. Nobody teaches the, the bradycardia. This is after nothing more than two amps of bicarb. Once again, this is the patient coming in, and then he gets nothing more than two amps of bicarb P waves reappear, heart rate comes right back up. Now, this isn't going to last long. So once we've got our diagnosis, now we start pushing the calcium, and then we get the insulin and call nephrology to dialyze this patient. All right. Um, and what else? So, oh, this is a great patient. This, uh, this patient, this is like a 45-year-old guy who was newly diagnosed with hypertension. And his, his physician started him on a potassium-sparing diuretic. Well, unbeknownst to the physician, he started some wacky new diet that had him eating seven bananas a day. No joke, right? So the guy one day, he's like, he's feeling really weak, really, really worn out. No surprise, he's hyperkalemic, which produces diffuse weakness. And he's also fairly bradycardic. So he calls paramedics. Paramedics arrive, and they look at this. Take a look. The QRS is really not that wide. T waves are minimally peaked, just maybe out there you'd notice it. Most people would probably totally miss the peaking of the T waves. The paramedics didn't see the peak T waves up there. Whoop. And so they give the guy some atropine. It doesn't work. Why doesn't atropine work in hyper K? It's not a vagal condition, right? So he arrives in the emergency department. Of course, we think our atropine's better, so we give him atropine also. Of course, it doesn't work. Right? Next step in ACLS, transcutaneous pacing. So we try tr transcutaneous pacing, and it doesn't capture. 
right? And that's been well documented in the literature. In the setting of hyperkalemia, the milieu and the myocytes is such that the electrical impulses from pacing don't capture. So both transvenous and transcutaneous don't work in many cases. So, of course, at the time, the, the people um, in, in my, my shop didn't know that he was hyperkalemic. So they're marching down ACLS algorithm. Next step is epi or dopamine. So we get started on a drip and it's not working. Why don't those work? Well, if you look at the chem seven of, of this guy, not only is hy he hyperkalemic, but what else is he? He's in renal failure, probably, and he's very acidotic. And in the presence of severe acidosis, your pressors often don't work, all right? So at this point, he is ready for transvenous pacing. They call up to cardiology because for whatever reason, there's no transvenous pacers in the ED. Cardiology fellow calls down and says, all right, no problem. I'll bring a transvenous pacer down. In the meantime, put a cordis catheter in, and when I get down there, we'll float a uh, cordis catheter or we'll float a transvenous pacer together. So the residents are high-fiving each other. Yes, we're going to get a transvenous pacer and a cordis out of this. They put a cordis in this guy. He's now got a right IJ cordis catheter. He's got a hole in his neck. Cardiology comes down, they open up the kit, and right then the lab calls with the potassium of uh, 7.9 or 8 or so. So they say, well, we've already opened the kit. Let's just float it anyway. So they, they float the transvenous, and it doesn't work. It doesn't capture. This has been documented in the literature. So finally they say, all right, fine. They push some calcium bicarb, bam. Heart rate comes right back up, problem solved. I've seen two people get cordis catheters before anyone realized that they were just hyperkalemic. Here's another one. Potassium here is in the upper sevens, and a new fascicular block, new right bundle branch block pattern up there in V1. It all went away after treatment. Here's another one, potassium 8.5. Look at that rhythm, right? Show me the peak T waves. Where are they? It's not even that wide of a QRS. This is not at all classic hyperkalemia on the EKG, yet this is classic in terms of what you're gonna see. Take a look at the sinus pause on this one, all right? Big time sinus pause, and there's your only peak T wave in that one impulse right there, right? And the QRS complexes are really not that wide. This is all classic. So please be on the lookout for these patients that are coming in with strange bradycardias associated with hyperkalemia. It's really, really common. And unfortunately, it's just not commonly taught, all right? Questions about hyper -K? All right, let's do a couple quick ones here and then we'll move forward. So this is 65, year, and then we'll take a break, all right? 65-year-old woman who had a syncopal episode. Now she's awake, but blood pressure is 78, so she's still hypotensive. We'll say that the right bundle is old. She's got an old right bundle, but just focusing on the rhythm. What do you make of the rhythm? So is there polyuria? First question. Yes. All right, so Mobus 1, Mobus 2, or third degree, your answer lies in just looking at the PRs. What's going on in the PRs? So let's see, uh, starting over here, there's a PR and looks maybe a little bit longer, uh, close, longer, and yeah, that's a Mobus 1. Now again, if you have any trouble seeing that, that it's getting longer here, just take a look at the, the lonely P wave and look at the PR right after and right before. Clearly different. So it's not Mobus 2. All right? So the big changes in the PR tend to occur right around the period of the lonely P wave. All right? So this is a Mobus 1. All right? Mobus 1, ventricular rate of 52. And. Um, She's hypotensive. At a rate of 52, uh, it's kind of a judgment call about whether you want to go ahead and give her some atropine or not from Mobitz 2. Some of you may decide to try some fluids first. Some might try atropine. I usually use 50 as my cutoff, but it's not a hard cutoff. So 52, uh, I might try some atropine, but either way. All right, you got the diagnosis though. Um, okay, why don't we, let's take a break. You guys want to take a break or do one more case? This is about a 10 minute case. Well, let's take a break.